So just to define Flickr, uh, there are two types as defined by the uh, IE visible Flickr, which is a modulation in light output over time, and then invisible Flickr. So that's also a modulation in light output over time, but you can only perceive it when things are in motion. So if you see an image above, that one's the ruler's not moving, but below you can see there's um, the stroboscopic effect. So it's not a smooth motion, it's the staccato um, imaging. And some of the hazards are uh, for visible flicker, just general distraction, unless you're in a disco, strobing is never nice. Um, to say even in like bicycle lights, I can't stand it. Um, I see like a bike mm -hmm. coming from across, and like turn your full, you know, just regular light on. Don't don't keep it strobing, because it also destroys my night vision. It's like ah, what's going on? Then the bigger problem, neurological problems. There's the Pokemon incident in Japan in the 90s where. Uh, unfortunately, a number of kids went into epileptic seizures because they had just the right combination of red and blue flashing alternating on the screen, and a lot of the little kids sat really close to the screen, so their whole field of view was filled with the screen, so a few had to go to the hospital because that um, combination was just the right frequency between, like, it was around 20 hertz and your sensitivity for flicker. If, if you have epilepsy, photosensitive epilepsy is between 3 and 70 hertz. Most of us don't have to worry about that. And then there's some very limited data that there is an increase in autistic behaviors. We'll see in coming years what that leads to. And then invisible flicker, what we'll look at mostly. Some of the hazards are, that were well documented and researched in the 70s and 80s from fluorescent light air, eye strain, headache, blurred vision, but we'll look into, I'll talk about more, is migraine, what I mentioned, stroboscopic effect, or kind of like you're doing the disco, and uh, just general reduced performance in reading or visual tasks because of headaches and eye strain. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you remember the old CRT screens that had a low frequency, and some people are more sent, have higher sensitivity to um, the lower hertz, so they either get migraines or just their eyes would be really tired. I know I have that problem. Um, luckily, those screens are long gone. Uh, there are a few flicker metrics that have been developed over the developed. Um, there's flicker percent and flicker index. And they both look at the waveform, but they're not ideal metrics. And I won't get too much into the detail of them. But um, both of them have sort of an issue where they don't actually look at the frequency of the waveform. So just to go over briefly over um, what, what the frequency is. So for um, for instance, in the U.S. here, we have a 60 hertz frequency, so that means that you know, the light's going on a full cycle 60 times in a second. In Europe, it's 50, so it's 50 times. But since it's um, going up and down, this isn't the best graph to show. Maybe we'll look at the next uh, next one. Sure, we'll go in here. So, like a full cycle would be going up and down. And if we look at the zero point, um, it becomes 120 hertz in the US because uh, the light will actually be turning on, sorry, this is the wrong graph to show that on, but um, on at full, sort of the high point, and then off at zero, and then on again at the low point. So if we look at the waveforms for going to incandescence. Almost everything shows that fluctuation um, from AC mains. So we saw it in incandescence, in fluorescence. We don't really see it so much. You don't notice flicker that much in incandescence because the filament actually
acts as a resistor and it just stays hot and there's not enough time for it to really cool down and to turn off completely. A lot of uh, fluorescents had, or later developed, um, uh, shoot, what's the word? Uh, phosphors that just stayed emitted like a little longer. But the real solution was the move from electron magnetic ballast to electronic ballast. So you can see that this fluctuation on the magnetic ballast is much larger than the electronic one. And the real thing to look at is the difference between sort of the high point and the low point. So sorry, I didn't describe the graph. So at the bottom we have the axis of time, and then here we have the light output. So the smaller the difference between you know, your maximum and minimum light output, the less likely you're um, to notice flicker. So the bigger the difference, the more likely you will see it. Um, so these are some waveforms from LED lamps. And you can see there's a whole different variety of waveforms from different lamp manufacturers. And so the first one, it's perfectly fine, it just never changes. It's probably a DC operated lamp. And then some of the other ones, like the two on the right, are sort of your worst case scenarios because they're going from zero, you know, from 100% output to zero. So you probably can perceive them, <coughs> perceive them flickering through stroboscopic effect. And my guess is they're probably AC lamps. And then um, uh, something that I'm sure a lot of you have noticed on your projects, once a lamp or a fixture could work perfectly fine when you have it on a switching circuit, but then when it's moved to a dimming circuit, things start to get a little hazy. So uh, things to look at, you know, so that's why sometimes maybe the manual small dimmers will have a trim on the bottom sort of to limit you from going <coughs> below this sort of lower percent where a fixture will start to dim. And I guess we have to look at the right combinations of the, looking at the lamp or the, your, LED source, your LED source, the dimmer that you're using, combination of the control system, uh, but what could cause flicker in LED lamps and, uh, and fixtures? Not looking at excluding dirty power issues, because that, <coughs> that's a whole crazy world that even I'm, I'm trying to figure out still. Um, so the main, the main sort of bad, bad eggs are uh, troublesome drivers and livers, AC LEDs which just exhibit the uh, AC curve. DC LEDs actually with poor drivers, like, um, what were they called, like switch? Constant switch voltage. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then um, some LED lamps on electronic transformers, base cut dimmers, so also known as triac, the old and this and dimmers and pulse width modulation drivers. Um, so right now there's no, until recently there was no real sort of consensus in the industry what to, um, how to figure out if a fixture flickers other than just getting a sample. So we've got, you know, the flicker reels, Osram is giving those out, so is Zaccato. Um, I actually have a few in my backpack if someone wants to play around with them. <laughs> um, also, people, you can you can take you know your phone and take a look if you get bars <coughs> across your um, screen, and also just shaking your moving your hand because if the fixture is flickering or has exhibits stroboscopic effect, um, you'll like on the little uh, lower right hand corner you'll see that um, your hand will just look like it's choppy. The movement will be choppy. Um, 
the other question, a lot of, initially when I started asking around the industry, mm. sort of at trade shows and <coughs> manufacturers, um, we're addressing the Flickr problem, people would just ignore me and say, oh, I don't, I don't see it, it's fine, and <laughs> it's true, some people, a lot of people don't notice it, but to a lot, it's um, kind of unbearable, especially if you go into a whole booth and the whole mm -hmm. booth is <laughs> <laughs> moving, <laughs> and you're like, oh, I, I just have to leave because I'm about to, you know, regurgitate the lunch I had. Um, so it's, there's, there's a big difference between not big difference, but a difference between um, what is detected on average by people and what's considered acceptable. So these graphs show on the bottom we have uh, frequency. So we have 100 hertz here, and it goes all the way up to 10,000 hertz, and then percent flicker on the um, vertical axis on both. And people can detect. Um, flicker to pretty high ranges. So this is the red region is 100 to 80, and then as we go on, it's a little more um, difficult to detect. But I'll focus on mean acceptability, and for the most part, uh, what is it? So the red region here. <coughs> This is around 100 hertz to 200 hertz here, and 54 to 100 percent. It's not acceptable, mm -hmm. or at least uh, you know, per this study, you can see the worse or higher your flicker percent can be to fall within that acceptability range. Um, but last last year, the IEE came out with a set of recommended practice. Practices and it's really they recommend to stay above 110, 100 hertz. And in combination with that is the flicker percent, because flicker percent doesn't account for frequency. So there are two uh, factors that they recommend using. So for low risk populations, sort of general public, you would use a 0.08 multiplication factor. And for high risk populations, that would be somewhere like, I suppose, like a healthcare facility or um, schools anywhere where people who are more sensitive uh, would be. So that's something you have to decide during your programming phase. And, and that's the 0 .033 uh, per, uh, factor. And so what you do is you take your frequency and you just multiply it by that factor. So uh, at, if our fixture is uh, 120 hertz, okay, we'll take our AC LED, multiply it by the 0.08 factor and we get 9.6 and that's rounded up. So according to this new recommended practice, <coughs> for 120 hertz for a regular population, the low risk population, the allowed percent flicker is 10 percent. But isn't that saying that AC mains is fine? In a way, yes, <laughs> but it's in combination with percent flicker, so you can't really just do one or the other because it's really following this kind of chart. So if you look at, you know, 120 here, and then, you know, if we guess 10 percent flicker is somewhere around here, it does fall within the somewhat acceptable um, region. But then if you have, you know, like a thousand hertz, kind of gives you a lot of freedom. Though I do have to say the IEE recommendation wasn't based on this exact particular graph, but the results are um, fairly similar. It was based on a a, sign a much larger body of studies looking at people's sensitivity to flicker. Um, but still, even um, with, what is it, like uh, with fixtures that are tested, and I know that the frequency is, of the drivers is much higher, it's still surprising sometimes I'll go into a project site space 
and you move your hand, and I still notice the stroboscopic effect, and I wonder, what, what could it be? It's like the, the driver is from you know, the same manufacturer as the control system, so they should be compatible, and I know that they run the fixture at much higher frequencies, so what's, what's really the, the problem there? Um, this happened to be in a sort of amenity space corridor, so it was okay, you know, no one but us, the lighting designers, really noticed in that case. But then in, um, so where, where does stroboscopic effect matter? Um, anywhere you have rotating machinery, hospitals, classrooms, video conference centers, filming studios, but I think even, even in restaurants, I remember recently going to a restaurant and the whole space was brand new, gorgeous, full, but it had LED coves, nice LED fixtures, but it was just all strobing. <laughs> so you'd go and move something, move your hand to grab something, and it was just like Ch -ch 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 -ch. Or also we were using chopsticks, it was a, a Asian fiction <laughs> place, and it was just like, you know, we had a few drinks, and after all, you know, it's like, oh, oh the effect fun. seems to wear off after you <laughs> Um, but you shouldn't have to have a drink or two for a uh, stroke and stomach effect. You know, maybe it's just blurred vision. Right now, if it's a Tetron Jackie restaurant, you'll see those knives. That would be terrifying. Yeah, like a culinary space. I, I wouldn't want to be there. I like all my fingers. And I'm challenged enough. I always cut my hands with knives. Um, yeah. Chuck, <laughs> yeah. So, kind of what I'm interested in is um, how to link this to migraines. So a lot of people suffer from migraines. In the do we do we do we still wanna? Is, is anyone interested? Should we keep going? Me, me. We. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, sure. um, so I thought I'd link flick a stroboscopic effect and flicker to migraines because it's. Um, Personally, I don't suffer from migraines, but I'm definitely uh, affected by flicker. And I have a number of friends who really suffer seriously from migraines. So it's actually pretty debilitating if you look at it economically, not just on a personal level because of the pain it causes, but um, it's, it's an estimated 13 billion that are lost annually because of emergency room visits, medication use, clinical visits, or importantly, lost days in work. And, um, something that can't really be quantified, but you know, the pain of people who suffer from migraines, like, you know, a migraine can last you know, a few hours to a few days for some people. And mostly women, unfortunately. Um, so what's the combination between migraines and light? Uh, there's a big photophobic um, connection uh, with migraines. So a lot of migraineurs will either be triggered by light, so um, the longer they're exposed to a certain light, to bright light, um, if they'll feel um, that'll make it worse. Um, the area of their eyes, so the re retina, the larger the area of the retina that gets stimulated, the more irritating it is. I mentioned brightness. Color temperature. Yeah, so that's something we're, I'm, I'm gonna get to. And then the contrast, so brightness contrast, and then with, um, and why it's a big big deal is because up to um, 60 to 80 percent of those with classic migraines um, recognize flicker as a visual stressor, so something that actually triggers it, and of those, um, even uh, scenes like this where you're maybe driving through country ro a road and you have trees that are lit from the side by the sun and just that repetitive wow. black and white pattern is enough to trigger a migraine. Hmm. Actually if a friend has a problem driving the fall she can't because of this. It's, it, she's like okay I'm pulling over your turn now. <laughs> um, I think like escalator stairs do it for some people because it's that repetitive pattern. Elevated subway lines. Mm -hmm. Drive under those. Mm -hmm. And then you get that, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll, I'll um, skip 
this one because it's just a repetition. But uh, looking at, I won't give a full brain eye explanation. I'm sure lots of you have attended enough lectures uh, or have done research on your own and know very well. So we have the eye, the retina, we have cones and rods, IPRGCs, which are um, intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells that were discovered around 20 years ago in humans. And they don't contribute to vision, mostly to non-vision functions like your circadian system. But now there's, um, in the last Six or six or eight years, they found that there's maybe a connection between the IPRGCs and the pathways that are responsible for migraines. So that's maybe where color temperature, or rather um, wavelength, so light color could come comes into play. So um, what happens? What a what a group of researchers did is they looked at a group of patients who were blind with non-functioning rods and cones, so they had no visual functions, but they did have IPRGCs, these uh, ancient um, retinal ganglion cells that are still connected to the brain, so the, the hypothalamus. And they found that when exposed to sh short wavelength light, which is the peak sensitivity sort of for um, IPRGCs, that sort of blue, dark, deep blue color, um, they did get migraines. And so um, the thought is that there's also in the, um, the thalamus, so this, you know, region where everything's connecting, is partly responsible for um, just general sensory reception. So for feel, touch, but also pain. So it's um, a lot of the pain reception is happening there. And that also goes to, um, it's interesting because in the eye, in the retina, you don't have any actual pain receptors in your retina. So you know, if you're looking at something and you're kind of blinking away, it's partly because of that direct connection to the brain, not because your eye itself hurts. Not the eye, but retina. Um, so how could this potentially be fixed, or what, not fixed, but what um, supports the idea that IPRGCs are sort of responsible in that pain network or connection to migraines is um, our tinted lenses. So this was something that um, people have been doing for a while on their own, or uh, someone came across and I don't think they're like there's a saying looking through rust colored glasses but maybe that's a different <laughs> meaning <laughs> but uh, red or rose tinted glasses actually have been found to reduce migraine frequency or sensitivity during photophobia so the idea is that they're cutting out short wavelength light so they're cutting that sort of signal to your IPRGCs that's then going to your brain. So that supports the role that they're involved. You can get your glasses tinted if you have um, you know, these sensitivities. And for some people it really does help if they feel a migraine coming on, they put their glasses on. Or for others it just lets them still keep working because they won't be totally knocked out to a non-functional state. But the Another thing, the reason I have this image here is um, other researchers have gone in another direction looking at that itself and the uh, macular pigment, which is right in front of the phobia. And it's the macular pigment is composed of lutein and, um, sorry, I can't read it, zeaxanthin. <laughs> but either way, they're basically red and yellow filters. And they kind of, cut or reduce, you know, that amount of short wavelength light that's getting to your phobia. So the thought for uh, some researchers is that maybe migrainers have a smaller or less macular pigment in their macula right in front of the phobia. So 
know, maybe eating the right foods or supplementation could help increase that. Or, you know, to replace that layer in your eye, you could wear red, the red tinted lenses. But um, not to cut out all the only other research, there's also been um, contrasting research that says that blue lens, blue lenses also um, help mitigate migraine reduction. Um, how and why? Uh, mechanisms are not quite well understood, but uh, you can't you can't just you know put in whatever you want. But so that's um, yeah that's uh, that's that you know. Um, got migraines? Try try some red lenses. Maybe they'll help. Or uh, recommend them to your friend. You never know. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.